This is what our, our program looks like today. We've got a bunch of good folks here to talk to you guys about Alex. Um, first off, we're going to hear from Carolina Delgado, who's a lead metadata specialist at OCLC. She's going to be talking about the interest group that she co-chairs for the um, for Alex new members, and also how Alex is generally organized. And then after that, we're going to hear from Carrie Cassio, our, um, our own Alex executive director. Um, who works at ALA headquarters in Chicago. She does great work with her staff to keep Alex up and running. Um, she's going to explain how to get involved with Alex. After that, current Alex president Vicki Seip from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County is going to talk to us about some exciting events we have planned in the next few months, um, generally kind of the goals and values of Alex as an organization. And then just before we take a short break, we're going to be asking you a couple of questions about what you're looking for from Alex. Um, we really hope you'll share your thoughts with us there. Um, we're always looking for feedback from our members. Um, following that break, we're going to hear from Netanel Ganin of Brandeis University and Lisa Spaniolo from UC Davis. They're going to take us through some of the highlights from the recent midwinter conference. So that's going to be great. And then finally, we're going to open up the floor to your questions. We're trying to allow as much time for that as possible. You can ask us anything about Alex. We'll be glad to answer. You should also feel free to ask questions during any of our segments for any of our speakers to answer. Um, we're keeping things informal, and we want to make sure that you're getting the info you need. Um, and finally, before we, we kick things off and, and hand the mic to Carolina. I'm going to introduce uh, Dina Groves from Western Kentucky University. She's the co-chair, my co-chair on the membership committee, and she's just going to say a few words about our group and the work we do. Dina? Thank you, Autumn. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's great to have you all with us today. The uh, Alex Membership Committee uh, is sponsoring today's webinar, and um, we see this as one of our responsibilities as we pursue recruitment efforts um, to retain and to increase membership for ELECs from um, existing and potential ALA members. We uh, are also involved with the annual ALA conference face-to-face -face ELECs 101 event, um, as well as the ELECs 102 after party event. So hopefully everyone is familiar with these who are able to make it to conference each year. Um, so if you're planning to be in Chicago uh, come June, we uh, invite you to join us at both of these events. Um, I know they're always the highlight of my conference each year. And um, it's open to those who have been around Alex a long time and those who are interested and those who are new to Alex. So pretty much everyone's invited, and it's always fun. Uh, as Autumn mentioned, our first speaker today is going to be Carolina, and I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, to this webinar, yeah. Uh, well, I'm Carolina Delgado. I'm co-chair for the Alex New Members Interest Group. Uh, I work for OCLC as lead metadata specialist, and I'm going to give you uh, an introduction about what Alex can offer. Uh, to the new members and to the new professionals for uh, on behalf of the professional growing and career development. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this interest group called ANIC uh, seeks to cultivate the new members of Alex. Uh, it, 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 we try to do that by capitalizing on existing Alex initiatives and Alex veterans to develop pathways for inclusion of new members into the Alex organization and a realization of the value of the new members' contributions to the organization. So we are a group of officers which is looking for activities, uh, planning a lot of uh, initiatives and programs to try to involve the new members and try to connect them with the a community of experts, which is called the Alex veterans. So uh, how do we do that? We tr use a lot of social media platforms. We use Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and you will see our social media channels soon to try to connect you with what Alex is doing for you. Next slide, please. So uh, in this moment, we, uh, we have 437 active members. 
two co-chairs in the group of officers, three vice co-chairs, one member at large, one social media coordinator, one secretary, and one student liaison. So the, the members are, all, are always invited to all the, or, all the activities that Alex uh, plans and develops during the year. So in, in this moment, if you want to be an officer for AMNI, just let us know because we are uh, looking for people for the next period. So this is how this group is structured now. Next slide, please. So based on the goal, we have as a, uh, an interest group looking for uh, the benefit of the new members. We do many things, and main of the things we do are virtual or online. So we usually have chats, blogs, interviews, and also we have um, many, many ways to contact uh, our new members online or doing virtual meetings. Uh, and those activities are focused on topics of interest uh, that the new members have. Uh, for example, topics of interest related to cataloging, collection and technical services, uh, tendencies in the uh, organization of uh, information for libraries, and professional growing in general. So we, you will see our social media channels, as I say, but uh, we try to have at least one activity per month. Uh, for the new members, and we support all, and promote all the activities that Alex is doing during the whole year. Uh, talking about, that's talking about the virtual presence and the online activities we can provide. But also we have presence in the ALA conferences. In midwinter, we have our new members interest group meeting, uh, which is a, a super um, nice space to get the new members talking with the community of experts. So we invite Alex veterans and organize roundtables with different topics. So the new members and the persons, in, the people interested in the association itself can interact with an expert and resolve many questions, get more information, and get the expertise, the expertise that they need. Uh, we also have this uh, event, and it's what is called Alex 101 in a, the AGLA annual conference. Uh, I, uh, Alex 101 is organized in conjunction with the membership interest group too. And it's, let's say, something like the new member interest group, but in a bigger uh, proportion. So that's our main event in the annual, uh, ALA annual conference. And we also provide some kind of games and uh, fun activities to do. Uh, last, in the last midwinter conference, we had, for example, the Alex Trivia Contest. So we invite new members uh, to participate about, uh, and get some prizes and be the winners uh, if they answer some of the questions or if they participate in the games we have. We usually have games and contests and trivias. Uh, when we have a conference coming. So um, just you just need to stay connected and you will see all the bunch of activities we can provide for you. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing in this slide is the Alexa structure. So uh, we have, uh, we, Alexa is a division of the ALA uh, itself. And we are the Association for Library Collection and Technical Services, and it's conferred by a board of directors. Uh, it also includes a list of committees, and, and we have also sections and divisions. So we have the acquisition section, the cataloging and metadata management section, the collection management section, uh, the section for continuing resources, and the section for preservation and reformity. Uh, each section has a board of uh, officers and create a, a own, her, a, their own activities and also each section includes a many uh, several interest group based on the goal uh, that that kind of section is achieving. So whatever your interest in a list is, you, uh, we have something to do for you. And with um, I think this is in general what is the Alexa structure. So you just need to connect to 
the website and you will see a whole description of each section as soon as you can go to our website. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, if you are a new member or if you want to know more about what we do for the Alex members, uh, just touch base, touch base with us. We have presence in ALA Connect. We have a Facebook uh, website too. We have an uh, account in Twitter. We have a um, new members list and we have presence in LinkedIn too. So those links that you are seeing in the slide are our main website, so any of those links can be helpful to you to connect with the organization itself. So just it, make contact, connect with us, and we can start providing with the helpful services, helpful information that can benefit your professional growing with Alex. So now I go to pass the, the, the presentation to Carrie. Thanks, Carolina, and thanks for all the work that the Alex New Members Interest Group does for Alex. Uh, it's it's always great to see how involved people can be right in the beginning, so I do recommend getting involved with them if you are able. So I'm Carrie Cassio. I'm the Executive Director of Alex. I've been in this position a little over two years now. You can find me online on Twitter at Carrie Brary, and I also have a picture here of my dog, Violet. She is also featured on Twitter a lot. I do post pictures of her, so if you like uh, dogs or ch chocolate labs, I highly recommend you getting on my Twitter feed. So I'm going to talk a bit about getting involved today. So the first thing you have to do is volunteer. You have to let us know that you're interested. So there's a volunteer form online, and when you fill that out, you can say what you might be interested in, and you'll also tell us what you do and what your interests and skills are. So if you get on the form, fill it out as thoughtfully as you possibly can and as completely as you can. Um, even though you'll tell us where you would like to be placed, sometimes the appointing officers will find a slightly different role for you because of some skill that you might have. And those appointing officers are the incoming president-elect, or rather the current president-elect, and that's Mary Beth Thompson, and then the chair-elect of each section, they will do the appointments for section committees. So you can volunteer at the section level with the interests that you have, or you can volunteer on the division level in a division committee. That's really up to you. You can make that choice. You do have to be a member of the section to be able to make um, volunteer for a section committee. Remember, you don't have to attend conferences to serve on committees. We get this question all the time. Um, it used to be that you had to physically come to midwinter and annual to serve, but we do so much work on our committees between conferences and so many online meetings that that's really no longer the case. So please, if something interests you but you don't think that you can travel, don't let that stop you from getting involved. You still have a place and you can still have a role within Alex. Another option would be to take um, an intern position. Intern positions allow you to kind of get to know a committee. It allows the committee to kind of get to know you. And it's a one-year term to see if this is really what you wanted and if it's part of your interests. If it is, then you then have an opportunity to be appointed as a full committee member in the future. So keep that in mind. You can also consider standing to be an interest group officer. So just as Carolina said, the new members interest group and MIG, they're always looking for officers each year to help out. And all of the interest groups turn over after annual. So if there's something that you want to get involved with and you want to be able to create programming or discussions on a certain topic, you can volunteer and get involved. It's a really easy way to get started within ALAX. The other thing I wanted to talk about today is uh, our continuing education and our publications. You don't need to be a member to be involved with a lot of our continuing education. Being a member will get you a discount on um, 
things that have a fee, such as webinars and web courses. We have a robust set of webinars every year. I would say we do two to three a month, and there are a wide range of topics. So some will be about cataloging, some will be about collection development or preservation. We really try to run the full um, interests of Alex in our webinar program. The web courses are there for more of the basics or what we call the fundamentals. So if you perhaps are moved into a different role at your library, there might be something there for you that you needed because you maybe you haven't done it for a long time. Maybe all of a sudden you're supposed to do collection assessment for your electronic resources. We actually have a course on that. So you do have options there. Our e-forms are free for anybody. We do that on a an email mailing list or a listserv uh, TM. That's the official, you know, that's a kind of like Kleenex. So when you ever, I say email list, I'm just trying to avoid using the word listserv. Um, so the e-forums run once a month for two days, and nothing else goes to that list except for that discussion. So it's really low traffic in between times, and then for those two days, it's a targeted discussion. And we have all sorts of different topics, and I think Vicki's going to talk about an upcoming one pretty soon. We also have more general email lists. So um, if you're interested in acquisitions, we have ACNET, Collection Development, we have CallDev, PADGE is for preservation. We also have Alex Central, which is General Alex News. So those are all there for you. You can find them on the ALA listserv site. We also have a new program coming up, which Vicki will talk about a little bit more, which is the Alex Exchange, and that's going to be a fully online conference. Uh, sometimes people ask us, we don't have our own conference like PLA has or ACRL. Um, or some of the children's divisions here. So this is our experiment this year, which we're very excited about, to be able to bring you some education, more, more in-depth education online without having you travel for conferences. We have multiple publications as well. Alexa News is free and open to anybody. That's news about the association and about our members and the work that they're doing. So we always, uh, put up reports from the annual conference and the midwinter meeting. So if you want an idea of what happened at the meetings that you could not attend, your colleagues have written up full reports and those are in Alex News. So those are being published right now uh, from the midwinter meeting. So it's a great resource for anybody who kind of wants an eye on what's going on in technical services. If you're a member, you automatically get a subscription to LERTS, that's Library Resources and Technical Services. If you're not a member, you're able to read it online um, except for a one-year embargo. So we're green open access, we're open access except for the most current four issues of LERTS. So you can read older uh, articles for free, you don't need to be a member, and that is all online. We no longer have a print publication for LERTS. On top of that, we do have a monograph series and we have guide series. So we'll put out monographs on things like linked data or um, shared collections. Those are some of our more recent monographs. We also have what's called sudden selector guides. So if you're in collection development and maybe you got a new subject or you want to pass that on to a colleague, we do smaller guides that allow you to learn about things like collecting for physics or collecting for biology, and those come out um, along the way uh, at different times. We also have some acquisitions guides that are also helpful. Much, you know, they're shorter texts, but they're certainly very practical and and very um, up to date with what's going on. So anybody can purchase one of our publications or of course you can get them uh, from the ALA store or whatever your service provider might be for acquisitions at this time. So that's a little bit about getting involved. Um, I really encourage you to take the time and fill out the volunteer form and um, oh, and then I just got a question. So somebody said for alerts, are you supposed to read an email about new issues once they're online? There is a way in the system to do that, but we're also now publishing a newsletter when they come out. So we just did our first one a few weeks ago with our January issue. But I have a caveat about that. When you become an ALA member, 
you choose how you want to be communicated with, with emails. And if you opt out of communications except for elections, you won't receive an email from us when it's ready. So even though we're trying to reach out to people to let them know when the new issue is available, we do kind of still have some privacy issues and the way that you have chosen to hear from us. And if you ever want to change that, you can talk to our member and customer service department, Max, and they might be able to help you with that. But it is a question we get a lot. We, we try to send things to members, but when you make some of those choices, and, and I did that when I was a member too, I only wanted to get stuff about elections. Um, then you might not get other things we send. It's just kind of how it goes. So thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so I'm going to pass it over to Vicki, and she's got a bunch of things to talk about about what's coming up with Alex. All right, well, hello. I'm Vicki Scheip. I'm the current president of Alex, and I want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today to learn more about Alex. So this year, we're celebrating. Um, we've been around for 60 years. It's our diamond anniversary. So for 60 years, uh, Alex has provided opportunities for education, publication, and collaboration to the library community in our areas of interest. Our engaged members have contributed to the profession, and they've developed their professional and organizational skills by involvement with our association, and welcomed new members through programs like this virtual LX 101, and we encourage those new members to become involved and contribute along the way. So all of these are excellent reasons for us to celebrate, and we definitely want to invite you to celebrate with us. I want to take the next few moments to spread the word about some of our upcoming opportunities that you might want to investigate. Um, that was Mika on the other side of the slide. I forgot to mention her, and she's just so eager to be seeing you. So. Um, first up, I want to talk about uh, our upcoming e-forum. Carrie just mentioned e-forums, and this one could not be on a more timely topic. Um, it, our forum is going to focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion in library technical services. It runs over the course of a couple of days, February 28th through March 1st. Um, you can click on the link that we've got here in the presentation to get more information about it. E-forums require that you register, but they're free. So you register and then um, you become part of that, uh, not list, um, but you become part of that um, e-environment and receive the posts and can yourself post to the forum and engage in the discussion. And we would encourage you to do that. Um, our three moderators for this multi-day event, they all did presentations during an ELECT symposium at ALA this midwinter meeting, and they all really are exceptional presenters. They have a lot of really good material to share on equitable access to collections, scholarly communication, and diversity, and also diversity and visibility in collection development and management, and a little bit on the inclusion and advocacy and cataloging as well. So I encourage you to participate in this forum if you're at all interested in this topic, which, as again, as I said, is, couldn't be more timely. Um, next up, I wanted to speak briefly about the ELEX virtual pre-conference that's coming up just before annual. And, Again, here's a theme. We seem to be focused on this theme this year, and I think it's going to help us out quite a bit in our work and in keeping it relevant um, and in making sure that what we're doing really meets some of these goals of achieving equity, diversity, and inclusion in the work that we do in libraries. And in this case, the virtual pre-conference is going to focus on metadata. Um, the dates are still to be announced, so again, I encourage you to use the link to catch up on when the actual dates are chosen, but it's going to probably be um, in late May or early June. And the topics that are going to be addressed in this pre-conference are going to include strategies for evaluating inclusivity or exclusivity of metadata. How do you decide on one way or another um, whether or not it's inclusive or exclusive, and how do you change that? We're also going to talk about tools and educational resources for developing inclusive metadata and strategies for working with diverse communities. This should be a really exciting pre-conference, and I hope that you'll at least check it out and hopefully register and participate. Um, the last bullet on this slide um, concerns the ELEX Mentoring Program. This is a brand new program for us, and in part we're taking it on this year, launching it during our anniversary year as part of our celebrations. Our first pairs of mentees and mentors are going to kick off their year in May. Uh, now, this is a program that's only open to members, so if you're not yet a member and you're interested, um, keep your ear to the ground on this because we have great hopes for what this can uh, 
accomplish, both for the mentors and the mentees that get involved. We're excited about the program and the tools that it's going to make available and the opportunities that people are going to have um, to really build off of the knowledge of their colleagues. And this is something that um, you're going to find in being a member of Alex happens informally almost every opportunity that you have to interact with members. Um, but here we're going to try and make it just a little more formal and see if we can't extend that um, education and development um, that we've been able to have happen more informally. So on the next slide, I've got a couple of other things um, that I want to talk about. This one, this is, uh, this is a pretty big deal. It gets its own slide. Um, the Alex Exchange, Carrie referenced it a little bit earlier, and this is definitely an anniversary event. Because it's an entirely new kind of event. It's something we've never tried before. And in looking for models on how to do an entirely online uh, conference, uh, for lack of a better word, um, but really an exchange of information and ideas around library work, um, we're really kind of it's a good way to celebrate, to try something new. So we're definitely stepping in those waters with this. It's um, going to happen over four days um, in two consecutive weeks, and we're offering, going to offer a, full, a fully online series of panels, presentations, posters, and learning opportunities. It's arranged in four-hour blocks over those four days. Um, the idea being that then hopefully you can have an opportunity to discuss with colleagues what you've just experienced in that four-hour block and then take it into the next day's events um, and bring that perspective to the discussions around the next topics. We have here two of our keynote speakers that will be presenting. and We're adding more speakers and more information on this event as we get closer. So follow the link here um, to get more information about this event. At least check it out because you may never see its like again. So let's go ahead and look at the next slide. If you happen to be fortunate enough to be able to attend the annual conference, um, we've already had mention of Alex 101 and Alex 102. And I'd like to encourage you to um, attend these. Uh, Alex 101 102 are generally on, well, they're on Friday evening during annual conference. This year, that'll be the 23rd of June. We generally kick off 101 around 7 o'clock, run until about 8.30. And it's an opportunity to circulate in a room full both of brand new members or people considering becoming members, along with folks who have been members for quite some time. One of the nice things about this is it's one of your first opportunities to really get that face-to-face -face networking um, kicked off within Alex. And uh, really, in being a member of Alex, that, that networking has been, for me, one of the more valuable experiences of being a member. And here's an opportunity to talk to people about their specialties with Intellex, um, their specialties within technical services. And I hope that um, if you're at conference, you'll take that opportunity to come and participate. Um, it's really one of the things that I should also mention is these events that I'm talking about, all of these events have come into being through the engagement and the involvement of members, along with our very talented staff. None of this would happen um, without our very talented staff. So hats off to Carrie and her colleagues in the office. Um, but also, it's the members getting involved in the nitty gritty in pulling together these programs, contacting speakers, and providing some of the content that makes these programs happen. And this is where some of your own professional development can happen. You get the opportunity to exercise your organizing skills, your opportunity to go out and ask people to do things, something you might not have done before. And I tell you what, that's going to serve you well um, for the rest of your professional career. So you're going to get exposed to that face-to-face -face at Alex 101. Now, Alex 102, uh, really, it, it's kind of informally 102. It's really the after party. So after we wrap things up at 101, um, they went, we then um, take off to a local watering hole for a little more casual um, vibe. And you'll find among the folks who attend, um, Alex officers, members from each of our sections, um, members from some of our interest groups. Um, there's finger food, there's prizes, there's great company. Um, so I hope you'll come and join us there if you happen to be coming to annual. And finally, another opportunity at annual, if you'll be attending annual. Um, every year we have the Alex President's Program. It's held on Monday morning um, during the ALA annual conference and features a notable speaker on a topic of interest. This year, uh, we've asked Lama to be a co-sponsor. Our speaker is Dora McWhorter. Um, she's a gifted and dynamic chief executive officer of the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. She is transforming 
the YW of Chicago into a truly 21st century social enterprise. She's developing STEM programs for girls 9 through 14, and under her leadership, the YW of Chicago is reorganizing itself from the inside out. Now, her topic for her program is going to be the business of social impact, creating a world where everyone has value. And I think this theme and this direction um, can speak to us as we look at our own organization and association, both at the OLEX level and at the ALA level. And I'm hoping that um, she will just give us that extra kick um, to get moving in this direction and to apply some of the things that she's been able to do and her own organization to our organization. So with that, um, let me turn it back over to Autumn and Dina. Um, they're going to kick off a little bit of a discussion and some questions here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki and Carrie and Carolina for being here with us and sharing all of that great info. Um, like Vicki mentioned before we take a short break, we would like to hear from some of our attendees out there about a couple questions that we have for you. And I do see that um, we have a question from Kumiko too, which we need to answer, which is about how to become a committee intern. Um, the volunteer form that Carrie mentioned a few slides back, um, that is the number one place to start uh, with any involvement with Alex um, Kamiko. So if you fill that form out and indicate your interest in becoming an intern in any Alex committees, um, that's how you get that ball rolling. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, and we have a couple of questions here for you. Uh, we'd like to know uh, what do you need from Alex that we haven't mentioned? And I know we have a good mix of folks out there from, from different backgrounds and libraries and different points in your career. Um, is there anything that, that we haven't covered here in, in our summary of what Alex offers that you would like to see? And you can use that question panel to submit any comments or feedback you have for us. And then the other thing I was hoping to hear from you guys about is, and this is a little bit related, um, but we'd like to know kind of the daily work that you do, the challenges you encounter, and the kind of support that you need most from your professional organizations. So if you have any questions or concerns about either of those, give us a holler. Okay. Um, there is a question from Denise. Uh, how do you get involved briefly if only for an event? That's a good question. Vicki, do you have anything to say about that? We don't, we, we're not that great yet with micro volunteering. We are not, but you know what? I would encourage you to fill out the volunteer form um, and indicate that in the volunteer form. And then we can snag you um, should something come along. Or if there's a particular event that you have in mind, um, I would encourage you to get a hold of either um, there's a couple of folks, Carrie, myself, Mary Beth Thompson, you've, but you have Carrie's email and my email. So I would encourage you to get a hold of one of us if you're interested in a specific event because, you know, things do happen where a few extra hands um, might be appreciated, but it would also um, definitely um, smooth the, the path if you're already an ELECS member. Um, that would be someone we'd be more likely to try and include, especially at the last minute. But we're really kind of generally looking for somebody who's going to be able to make a little bit of a commitment um, to work with a group of folks, either in a committee or an interest group. But, you know, there's no reason why we can't try and find you something, um, particularly if you have a particular interest or a particular set of skills. Okay. I think the next question might be something for Autumn, for student involvement. What can students do with Alex? You know, this has been a real hot topic um, in our discussions in the membership committee, um, ways to reach out to students and, and get them more involved. Um, we, and Dina can probably speak more to this, um, we are working on a, a student ambassador program or an ambassador program to reach out to students in, in um, LAS degree programs. Dina, do you want to say a couple words about that? Absolutely. Great timing. <laughs> um, yes, we've sent uh, this, this uh, about the last semester, 
uh, going over and setting up what an elect student ambassador program would look like. Um, and I think we're, we're off to a good start. We have our, our mission statement and our purpose and commitment and our goals. And we now have our first volunteer uh, elect member to sort of pilot this for us for the remainder of this school year. So uh, with all fingers crossed, we're hoping to offer this to elects in general starting um, in late summer for the beginning of the fall school year. And pretty much the, what it involves is just an Alex member who um, is willing to reach out to a school, like Autumn said, uh, the LIS students and the faculty as well to sort of make that connection uh, with our organization to show them you know, what we have to offer them, especially when they're students and they can you know, have that ALA and Alex membership at a reduced rate. So that's, that's always important too for students. But just to show them what we have to offer them, and uh, to get them involved with with Alex as well from the you know from the ground up before they get that first professional job, and and can definitely see the value of Alex at that point for sure. But sort of you know get get them while they're young, I guess. So uh, be looking for more information on uh, and it's called the Alex Student Ambassador Program, and uh, we're really excited about it. Thank you. Let, let me also chime in, if I might. Uh, this is Vicki. Um, because of that, I mean, I first joined ALA and Alex when I was a student, again, because of the, the student rate, which was really nice. But we have um, many students who have served as interns to committee as a way to um, introduce themselves um, to the larger organization and to get familiar with how committees work. So they're just because you're a student, that's not a reason you can't volunteer um, for a committee or an intern position. So keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, you, you would need to be an ELEX member in order to do that as well. So. Okay, our next question is, do we have support for solo librarians and special collections? Um, I would say that we have support for just about anybody doing anything. Thing. Um, I don't know if we have a community for solo librarians. We've talked about that before because it is very common that we have members who are the director, the cataloger, the acquisitions person, and the reference desk all wrapped into one. Uh, anybody else have comments on that? Well, this would be a good question for an Alex list because um, we do have a lot of members. We have many members who are solo um, librarians, um, and we have many who are in special collections. So that intersection, I don't know if there were uh, some way to post just a query on Alex Central and ask for folks in similar situations and see if we can arrange something. But that might all but also be something um, to think about for the mentor mentee program um, when the next um, when we get ready to set up the next program is to go ahead and look at maybe becoming um, a mentee, look for a mentor in that specific situation. And of course we do have resources in the webinar archive um, that can help out with topics that are specific to special collections that might help with them. Um, some of just the regular skill base that you might want. The membership committee has discussed this very topic this year as well, uh, and um, we're hoping, you know, that to, that maybe we'll, we can reach out to uh, some solo librarians to, to, like Vicki said, to get some input from them. And if any are on today, we uh, Autumn and I welcome you to uh, send us any information you might have and ways that, that we can re reach out to this population of folks that might sometimes feel isolated. Okay, the questions keep coming in. Uh, so somebody says, and I think that's kind of from what they need from us, somebody says they need support from other technical services librarians or catalogers because uh, that person is the only cataloger of their small academic library. And I think a similar question also came in that their challenge from somebody else is doing more with fewer staff members and how do we keep up to date on all our changing technologies. That is such a theme. Um, I know that uh, when I talk to my tech services colleagues, um, this is a challenge a lot of uh, units are facing. 
um, I know in my own institution we've recently had a cataloger retire. Um, we are not going to be able to immediately replace that person. So there is a lot of thinking about how to stay on top, how to plan for future developments, but also get those books out on the shelves um, or get those books ordered or, or keep those collections up to date. Um, and I think this is where if you are able to follow the things that go on at conference, even if you can't attend, and we'll talk some more about this, um, but if you're not able to be present at these um, presentations and conversations that happen at the conference, that's fine. There's so much of that information available to you afterwards. Um, there is a lot of discussion happening in these interest groups about workflows and efficiency and new tools and, and folks um, trying different ways to do their work more effectively, to work smarter, um, to address those challenges that I think so many of us are seeing in our units. Um, this is some great feedback, by the way, guys. This is, I really appreciate all the comments and the input. Um, Carrie, do we have other things that we need to we do. look at? We do. Okay. Uh, but I did also want to add to that. Make sure you're looking at Alex News for the reports. Most interest groups try to post uh, slides from presentations on their Connect space. If you're not familiar with it, connect.ala.org is where the work of Alex and ALA happens, so that's where you'll find meeting agendas and minutes and presentation postings. And if for some reason you can't find the presentation but you think it sounded really interesting, don't hesitate to send an email to the person who did the presentation. They, I would say 99% of the time would be happy to share it with you. So even if you couldn't attend, uh, people are always really pleased to be able to share their work and their research. And just another quick note, um, we have a list of all the interest groups in Alex that is in our, on our web pages that you can find under, um, let me think it's Alex, and then we have groups and committees, I think, is or committees and groups. I think interest groups are actually linked from the top of the page. Okay, good. Yeah. So go to that interest groups link, link and then look at the names of the interest groups and the scopes. Take that name over to ALA Connect once you find one, because um, you, I think it was, was it um, Dina or was it Autumn that just mentioned um, workflows and efficiencies? We have an interest group that's about that. Um, technical services, developments of technology and things, we have interest groups that focus on that. So take a look at what interest groups we have and then look for the work that's been done by that interest group in the Connect space. Okay. Um, there's one quick question. Um, to volunteer or participate, do you need to travel to the conferences? No. You do not need to travel to conference to volunteer for a committee, so please feel free to volunteer even if you will not attend a conference. Um, another question was, what committee or interest group would we recommend for a newbie cataloging metadata librarian or a newbie head of cataloging? Oh boy. <laughs> There are so many that I think are right. um, <laughs> so instructive, I don't really know where to begin. Um, honestly, my first involvement with Alex was with the new members interest group. Um, it was just a way to sort of get to know the organization. Um, but then I was an intern on the children's and young adults um, literature cataloging committee. I'd, I've gotten those words scrambled a little bit. Um, but I served as an intern on that for one year and it was a really, um, even though at that time at MSU we didn't have a children's literature collection, it was a really fascinating look into um, the way other institutions handled their cataloging policies and their practice and their day-to-day -day work and the discussions that happened at that committee meeting were really instructive. Um, so I would say any of the committees um, that you see listed there in the CAM section, um, starting out as an intern on any of those would be just a wealth of helpful info. Does anyone have anything more specific they'd like to recommend? That's, uh, I would really yeah, suggest that they start, as you alluded to, with the cataloging and metadata management section page. We have five sections, and one of them is specifically about cataloging. Um, so I would suggest that that's a really good place to start. And also there's, um, I, you know, I hesitate, Big Heads. Um, what's the official name for Big Heads that happens at annual conference? It's the meeting of the heads of cataloging departments of large research institutions. Technical and I always find that, department. 
sorry? They're technical services departments, not just cataloging. I'm sorry, yeah, technical services. So it's a little bit broader, but it's what's the committee that they meet under? It's a CAMS committee, though, right? No, Big Heads is in a Lex is in a Lex interest group. It's tech. Okay, so it's an interest group. Services librarians of large research libraries. I don't even remember what it is. I'm sorry. I, I'll look it up just to, <laughs> but they have their meeting generally on Friday morning at conference. Um, they didn't have one at midwinter this year, but they will be having one at um, annual. So if you happen to be attending conference, and again, this is a group that posts um, a lot of information after the fact, um, so you can find that in the Connect space. Um, but there, that'll give you some idea um, of what the large organizations are looking at. And then there's also a Heads of Cataloging Departments IG um, interest group. So that might be another good place to look for materials and or support. And of course, there's always the webinar archive. I can't say enough about the webinar archive. Go see what webinars we've presented in the past um, that might be of assistance to you in your position. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, someone asked if we can display the URL for the volunteer form again. We'll send the slides to everybody after the session, so you'll have that. But if you go to the ELEX website, there's a button at the top of the page that says volunteer. That will bring that to you as well. Autumn, I think there is another comment about the type of support someone needs for their work. Did you, or how are we doing on time? Or do we want to just take that um, as input for the membership committee? Yes, I have actually made a note of that. I okay, appreciate great. that comment. Um, and we do probably want to go ahead and take a short break. So I want to give you guys a chance to stretch your legs and, and recaffeinate and all that good stuff. So why don't we break for five minutes? And if you didn't get your question answered or, you, or you've thought of some more, don't worry. We have built in some time towards the end, too, for more questions. Um, but for now, let's break for about five minutes. And we will see everybody back here at 3.55 p.m. That is Eastern Time for those of you all over the nation. You'll have to do your own conversions. Thanks so much.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed that quick break. Um, I want to say thank you so much again for that valuable input you shared with us um, a few minutes ago. The membership committee is always looking for ways to better serve our community. We are going to carefully consider everything that you've said so far. Um, and we're going to go ahead and jump right into the rest of our program now. For anyone who is just now joining us, welcome. We are about to hear from two very involved ELEX members, Netanel Ganin and Lisa Spaniolo, who are reporting on some conference highlights for us. Um, before I pass the mic their way, though, I did want to show you this gratuitous kitten picture and mention a couple of things for those of you who aren't usually able to attend annual or midwinter conferences. Um, we certainly recognize, like we were discussing earlier, um, I think we're seeing that uh, operations budgets for, for technical services units and really for libraries in general can, can always be a challenge. Um, support for travel isn't always available. But even though you can't be there, um, if you're an ELEX member, your dues are actually supporting the work of the interest groups and the committees that we've been talking about. Um, it, it makes it possible for us to host these interest groups and, and invite these speakers from libraries all over the country and the world uh, to talk about developments in their collections and their technical services work. Um, this allows some really important exchange of ideas and discussion which advances cataloging practice for the whole community or uh, acquisitions practice or um, in, in any of the areas that we work in. Um, and this is true of committee work too. We have some really dedicated ELEX members who do the hard work of shaping cataloging policy or um, collections policy and, and re recommending revisions to standards and guidelines and, and frameworks. And, these are the, the professional recommendations and, and the guidelines that really steer our daily work and we owe a lot to the folks who put their time and energy into advancing our professional community. So if you're an ELEX member, you're supporting those advan advancements. Um, you can benefit greatly from them as those decisions and updates are made available. Um, ELEX does work hard to collect all the important presentations and, and um, material from these conferences. Um, we share them widely with our members on ALA Connect, um, which we have talked about a little bit. That is the collaborative space that we use. Um, you can find committee meeting minutes, presentation slides posted in the weeks following each conference. Um, I have often reached out to speakers whose presentations I missed to ask questions, and they've all been so ready to fill me in on things I didn't understand or, or provide for their info. Um, so I encourage you to consider those benefits um, of ELEX membership. Take full ad advantage of them. And like Carrie mentioned, ELEX News is another great source um, for info uh, following conferences. Lots of really well-written reports from, from sessions that happen at those conferences. And one last thing I want to draw your attention to is Twitter. Um, if you follow the ELEX conference hashtags, that's a great way to keep up on real-time discussions and like reports on presentations just from your desk. Um, there's a lot of great conversation between uh, conference attendees and folks who are um, working from their offices just about the topics that are being brought up at these conferences. Uh, Netanel and Lisa, for instance, are seriously active conference tweeters. I try to do some tweeting of my own. I do not have their talent for condensing the salient points and getting them out quickly, so I encourage you all to find them on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> the pressure is on now, you guys. Um, and to follow others you may see using those hashtags during the conferences. Um, Dina, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Have I covered? I think that's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, I, I encourage you guys to um, get on Twitter as a good starting point for um, following these uh, conference highlights. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and we're ready to hear from Netanel. Take it away, Netanel. Hi, thanks, Autumn. Um, I actually just want to put in a plug real quick because I realized I didn't write it down. Uh, my, my Twitter handle, if you do want to check me out during conferences or even during other times, uh, I always have cataloging, the hot cataloging content that you may enjoy. It's at op onions, like opinions, but for onions. So check it out. 
Anyway, thank you. Uh, I'm Netanel Ganin, a cataloger with a Hebrew specialty at Brandeis University. And I wanted to talk with you folks for just a few minutes about some of the interesting things that I heard and saw at the most recent ALA Midwinter Conference. <coughs> Sorry, you'll have to excuse me. I'm also uh, coming off a cold, but bear with me. So a little, a little bit of background uh, so you know where I'm coming from with respect to this is, uh, like thousands of other catalogers across the country and the world, probably tens of thousands, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm sure uh, the good folks at Alex could correct me on this, how many catalogers we have. I use Library of Congress subject headings, or LCSH, every single day. But I strongly believe that all of our cataloging standards, vocabularies, and codes need constant maintenance to remain as useful as possible. When we're describing resources, we need to remember that we're describing them not just for ourselves or for other catalogers, but for our patrons. An outdated, offensive, incorrect, or just plain non-intuitive terms can hinder searches and turn away people from our resources entirely, which is obviously not what we want and not what they want. It doesn't serve anybody. So with that in mind, I wanted to highlight a session I attended, the CAMS Forum, where two speakers discussed changes to LCSH. And I thought it was particularly interesting that while they both spoke about updates and changes, they really came at it from two very different perspectives. CAMS is the Cataloging and Met Metadata Management section of Alex, which I think uh, Vicky spoke about earlier. Um, it's my personal favorite section, but they're all great in their own way. Uh, and the forum that they hold is always a great place for longer presentations that have room for discussion. First, Janice Young of the Policy and Standards Division at the Library of Congress uh, uh, presented about some of the history of broad changes to LCSH. And then Tina Gross of St. Cloud University spoke about a change to a single specific heading, really granular, narrowed, narrowed focus. Janice spoke from an LC perspective on, on broad subject heading changes. She opened by pointing out that in ALA's Code of Ethics, the very first point includes, we provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources. That specific phrase, usefully organized resources, really spoke to me as catalogers, uh, as a cataloger, grounding our work in the values that we hold as a profession. But in order to make sure that our resources remain usefully organized, LCSH must be reflecting terms that users will know, recognize, and search by. Janice outlined the internal process by which changes to headings are made. Much of these processes involved her team and her predecessors staying aware of cultural shifts. Because uh, while some su subject headings have changed often, as the term used for that subject has changed in popular and academic usage. An example she provided was that in 1924, there was a subject heading term, cripples. In 1956, it was changed to physically handicapped. And finally, in 2001, and still until today, the term is people with disabilities. She also provided examples of current events whose names may fluctuate frequently as the, the terms by which the current event is referred to is very different in the media as the event itself changes. That was a little confusing, but an example of that is the type of heading uh, uh, with the events in Syria rising out of the Arab Spring protests. That heading underwent several revisions as sources kept changing how they were referring to it. Now, while today LCSH can be changed quickly uh, with computer automation and programming, that wasn't always the case. My, my personal favorite example of a very slow change was that it took, and it wasn't until 1982 that the LCSH European War 1914-1918 was changed to World War 1914 to 1918. That was 1982 that we got that done, that they got that done. I should give the credit where the credit's due. Janice also touched on the important work that non-LC catalogers do as part of the SACO program to change headings. That's the Subject Authority Cooperative. This involves drafting and submitting proposals through a closed system, which the Policy and Standards Division then evaluate on a monthly basis. So this was a, a presentation from the official Library of Congress and Library of Congress adjacent method for subject change. And I always, I always enjoy finding out how the sausage gets made, despite the euphemism, um, and to torture the euphemism a little bit, I think it's especially important to see how the sausage gets made by the head sausage makers who oversee the entire sausage making program. Because they know the most, I mean, they're the ones making the sausage at the big sausage factory. So I think, I, I really value that perspective. And then from a slightly, from a much more narrow uh, point of view, Tina, talked about the drive to change the subject heading illegal aliens and its associated headings. 
The push to change this heading had its origins in Dartmouth College students and the Drop the I Word campaign, which you may have heard of. Um, this campaign focuses on the usage of the word illegal in U.S. law and rhetoric, emphasizing the dehumanizing effect that such language can have. When the students at Dartmouth were doing research in a library and realized that LCSH had the term illegal aliens, they created a proposal through the Subject Authority Cooperative to change it. The PSD did not approve the proposal, and at that point, Tina got involved. As she was a member of the Subject Analysis Committee, which, as I said, is part of, uh, did I say it? it's part of CAMS, which is part of ALEX, so it's, it all falls under that umbrella, she was capable of assisting them in navigating the pathways of subject heading changes. Along the way, a working group was formed in the SAC, the ALA Council voted on a resolution to support the change, and eventually the PSD agreed to the change. But then, in a move that no one could have predicted, uh, the United States Congress itself got involved. Things have stalled uh, for a while since then, and we, we are expecting any day now to hear the final decision, if they'll change the heading, illegal aliens and its associated headings, and if so, what they'll change the headings to. So again, as Janice showed, there are traditional pathways for changing LCSH, and those wheels do turn more quickly than they used to. But as Tina demonstrated, sometimes an outside method is necessary because the ordinary channels may have proven nonproductive. What I really liked about these two presentations, about changing Library of Congress subject headings, one from within and one from without, is as a cataloger, I never want to stay complacent and accept that the terms and the standards and the codes that we inherit are unflawed and untouchable. They need revising and updating and agitation with thoughtful people like you to make them better and more equitable. Because as Canadian rock band Rush teaches us, changes aren't permanent, but change is. There will always be change. So let's all jump into the conversation and be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Netanel. And it, we're going to hear from Lisa next. Take it away, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Spagnolo, uh, our Acquisitions and Licensing Librarian at University of California, Davis. Um, like Netanel, I have a picture of my base up here as well. Um, I haven't been playing as long as him, but, but it's something I really enjoy. I debated putting my cat up, but, but that's what you get. Um, my, my overview from the conference um, covers a lot of different topics. Um, I'm our unit head here in Acquisitions, and then we also just came off of a um, a, a migration to, to a new system, so uh, I was involved in that. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my conference road and how it, how it ties back into Alex. Um, I've also uh, been the chair of the acquisition section, so I have a lot of, um, a lot of experience in a lot of different ways in, in Alex. So, so again, kind of getting into that broad overview. Um, First, talking about the uh, ELEX Symposium on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion that, uh, that Vicki talked a lot about. I was on the program committee for that, and Netanel was one of the attendees. And um, it was just a landmark event for spending time as professionals to affirm these values and explore how we can incorporate uh, these values in our work in collections and technical services. And I think um, Netanel focusing on, on the sessions that he did really bring that to light for cataloging. Um, the other topics that had to do with access to information, scholarly communication practices, um, and preservation, how we preserve the diversity of our lived experiences, all kind of touched on our work in different ways. For me in acquisitions, the sessions that were most uh, pertinent and got me thinking about what we do here um, were the two sessions, one with um, Harrison Inafuku and Charlotte Rowe talking about scholarly communications. Um, and they were, uh, they have done a lot of studies and a lot of presentations about um, the demographics across our scholarly publications and how that might change. Um, they did promote a framework uh, on how we can do better to improve diversity in those publications. Um, and they include looking at open access and um, marginalized publications in our library catalog, how they are discoverable. Um, looking at our subscription patterns to see if we can provide uh, a wider voice for, um, for more people. Um, and also challenging uh, how the structures of um, how the structures of our scholarly communication you know, patterns are. Um, 
so it kind of got me thinking a lot about how I interact with collection development to um, to bring that into my daily work here in the in technical services. The other session uh, was by Paulo Gagilda um, talking about um, uh, diversity and visibility in collection development management, and he was stressing creating a feeling of belonging in the collection and how we do that. Um, and some of the um, topics that he stressed was how we focus on area studies, um, ethnic studies, gender identity materials, and how we do assessment and, and evaluation to build a more balanced collection. Um, looking at our approval plans and demand-driven acquisitions plans and how those are uh, including a diverse number of publishers. So those two for me, for, for my, where I sit in acquisitions, were the most um, uh, you know, pertinent. They had the most takeaways for me in terms of how I, in my role, where I sit, uh, how I engage equity, diversity, and inclusion as a professional. Um, the other sessions uh, that have been referred to, again, you'll see them in that e-forum um, as well as um, the... What other session is there? There's that other session that Vicki mentioned that I lost track of. Um, then I want to look at a couple other programs that I that I went to. One was um, uh, an Alma program. It wasn't an Alex program, but it was a vendor-sponsored program. And as you know, you are an Alex member, you you may get involved in different ways. But I also encourage you to get involved in um, in, in some of these other other programs. Um, as I mentioned, we just went on to Alma and uh, needed to, um, you know, needed to shore up. We went on, we went live in August. And so this was just a great networking opportunity for uh, me to kind of get, uh, get updated on how uh, people were doing with their migrations and have some takeaways. So um, one of the people that we worked with in our migration was one of the presenters, uh, Betsy Friesen, and it was just great to have that additional networking opportunity with her. Um, and then I want to call your attention to uh, actually a cataloging session. Um, I do encourage you to go to sessions that are uh, outside of your area. Um, sometimes they will have an application to uh, an approach of your work rather than the domain uh, you know, the particular domain of your work. So, um, so what I want to point you to is um, this Heads of Cataloging Department Interest Groups. It's Alex Cam's uh, interest group, and uh, we talked about that before in our session. There were two presentations. One was um, on transformation of cataloging and metadata operations, and this was a presentation of a research project by Jeremy Minty of University of Utah and Liz Wolcott from Utah State. Um, and the URL is there at the bottom. And they were looking at basically the changes in cataloging units with respect to staffing hierarchies and unit arrangements, levels of staff, as well as the changes in the skills being deployed and developed. And if you go to that URL, you'll just see a wide variety of charts and conclusions. You'll see their slides from the conference as well. Um, so just in terms of how we're approaching um, the management of, of our technical services units, looking at trends, how we're recombining or um, uh, responding to reductions in staff, this presentation did a great job in kind of digging deep into some of those, um, some of those patterns. And then the second uh, topic in this session was um, discussed by Hannah Summers. She's Associate University Librarian at George Washington University. But what she was sharing was some time when she was at NPR and working with catalogers there. And they had just lost some staff and they had backlogs that were accumulating. And uh, this may resonate from some of the earlier questions we had in, in the first part of our time together today. Um, so they were, you know, they kept on saying, you know, we need more staff, but um, they had to rethink how how to deal with it. So they tried. They adopted Agile and Scrum uh, from a software production cycle to their cataloging backlog, um, taking on a two-week production cycle, having stand-up tactical meetings, very dynamic goals, 
and, um, and applied that to their backlog, and they had great success with it. So, um, so again, you know, this was a cataloging um, session, but where I was coming, uh, coming at it from was one of our projects is to um, scan a lot of our legacy licenses. So I'm looking forward to using this as an approach from, from a cataloging presentation to what we're doing here in acquisitions. So I encourage you when you're looking at some of these sessions to have a broad view and, and go further afield than, than you might otherwise. Um, and then I just have some words about exhibits, um, just a brief, brief words of wisdom. Um, I've been an acquisitions librarian since uh, 2004, and um, I've met a lot of our vendor reps. Certainly they come to your library, but um, at conferences that's a great way to, um, to connect with them. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet with your non-US vendors if you don't get an opportunity to see them. I usually make an agenda, so um, so I won't go to the same vendors each time, and uh, it changes from year to year. A few years ago, um, I didn't have licensing, and I took it on, um, so I had a different vendor mix uh, in terms of who I was seeing than in earlier years. So I went to like the five or six um, publishers that we had active licenses with. Um, this year was a little bit lighter, and I had a had we just had some on-campus visits, so I didn't need to see certain vendors as much. So I, I just had a little different combination of, of who I saw there. Um, the other thing I was involved with was the um, new members interest group uh, serving as one of the elects veterans, and it's something that I really like to do. Um, I enjoy meeting um, our newer members and um, sharing some of the things that, that I've learned in elects. I've really enjoyed um, serving in sections, interest groups, um, at the ELEX level as well, and um, it's just been a great, great experience. Um, I am on Twitter. Uh, I'm L Spags on Twitter. I tweet at conferences. Um, I do my best. I do my best, I'll say that. Um, I encourage you to um, review uh, the program if you can attend conferences. Um, again, as Autumn mentioned, checking for slides looking for publications and uh, conference proceedings, uh, and you'll, you'll get all that information. So that uh, was my conference experience. Over to Autumn. Thank you so much, Lisa and Netanel, for being here to share that info with us um, and for all the very informative tweets you sent out during the conferences. Lisa, I think you're a way better tweeter than I will ever be. Um, I hope that this kind of super condensed flyby of the recent conference was helpful to those of you uh, maybe just getting started in your field or perhaps taking your first steps into professional involvement. Um, we wanted to kind of give you an idea of what goes on in LX, the hot topics that are up for discussion at the moment, ways for you to tune into these conversations. Um, and now we'd just like to open up the floor again to the attendees. If you have any questions that were not answered the first time around, um, please feel free to, to direct questions to any of our speakers in particular about what they've shared or anything regarding Alex in general. Um, we're excited to hear from you again, and I, I think we have Carrie looking at our, our questions list there. Yes, uh, we, I don't think we've had any additional questions yet. We certainly can okay. as we go along here. Um. One thing I might ask, I know we talked a little bit about um, the, kind of the biggest challenges uh, folks face in, in collections or technical services work. Um, for those of you who are already Alex members, what have you found beneficial thus far from your involvement with Alex? Vicki, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, I was just, it's one of those questions where, what was it, was it Autumn earlier who said, oh, there are just so many, I'm just not sure how to answer that. <laughs> but, I mean, I think one of the more valuable things for me out of Alex um, has been the community um, that I find of uh, professionals who are 
all, you know, looking at the same kinds of issues, um, workflows, uh, training needs that I have um, that are willing to share of their time and their expertise um, to help me with my little problem um, that I have. So that's been just invaluable. And I've also come, I spent a lot of time with our continuing education programs. And I have found them to be um, of great value when I've sought out topics that I could utilize myself. But I've also found just the ability to put together a presentation and present it as part of our continuing education program, something that has just really um, helped me to better formulate my thinking on how to do something or help me figure out how it is I do something and how it might be that I could teach someone else to do that. So continuing education and just the community that I've found in Alexa probably been two of the more valuable, that and fellow dog lovers, um, have probably been uh, some of the things that I've found most, most useful and helpful personally. This is Lisa. I would just say that, that also over the course of your career, what you need will, will change. And so whether you're getting that through networking or some content or, or even if you need to um, you know, assess, hey, I need to round out my strengths in a certain area, there, there's an outlet for you in Alex, whether it's you know, serving on a, on a particular committee or working on um, a, a program or um, publications. There's just a lot of different venues for you to say, hey, you know, I need to add that particular thing to my portfolio if it's something you haven't done already and are interested in, that um, there, there's that outlet for you. That's a great point. Um, this is Autumn again. I was just thinking about um, the first few times that I uh, presented at a, an Alex interest group, um, and it's so true what Vicki said about having to think through um, the processes that you use at your own institution. Um, really kind of getting all of that out of your head and into a logical order so you can communicate it with other, um, with your colleagues. Uh, it really has um, made a difference in the way that I think about my work and kind of the input that I've gotten back from other folks doing similar work. Um, it has really kind of profoundly changed the way that um, I approach my responsibilities and I have really appreciated that sense that I am not making all of these decisions on my own, um, completely, you know, working on my own little island over here. Um, there is so much changing practice and a good deal of factors, um, so many different competing things to balance. Um, like uh, I think uh, Kumiko mentioned in a comment earlier, there's the for those of us who are catalogers, that daily practice, and then um, maybe administrative tasks, and then there are sort of policy making and supervisory things. Um, balancing that stuff, I, I continue to find challenging. So I really appreciate um, the opportunity Alex has given me to th intentionally think about that stuff um, and to listen to other people do the same, um, kind of in a back and forth conversation. Um, I think one other question that I was hoping uh, we could get some of our attendees to answer is why did this webinar appeal to you today? Does anyone want to share about that? I don't see any questions popping up, but I do want to let you know that um, we really hope to make this sort of an annual event. Um, not only to to introduce um, maybe folks who are new to Alex to the work that we do, but also just to keep in touch with with um, anyone who's unable to travel to conferences. This is a great way to touch base with you guys to hear your questions, um, and and to really uh, understand what it is that we can do better, um, things that we can provide, services that we can create. I'm seeing a couple comments come through from folks who would like to be more involved, would like to become better acquainted with Alex resources. Um, it's great to hear from Brandy, who is a new LIS student, uh, 
wants to dive in as much as possible and, and get some exposure to the stuff that we do. Um, so hopefully what we've covered here has given you a good place to start. Um, we're growing close to, uh, we're wrapping up some of our time here today. Oh, uh, another question. Go ahead, Carrie. Uh, there was a question if we have a quick start guide or a list of recommendations for new members. Um, I don't believe that's something that we have. We do have member how-tos. So there's a volunteer page that kind of explains a little bit about volunteering. Um, but I'd say you can always touch base with any of us and we'd be happy to help you if you kind of have an idea. There's just so many different ways to get started. Um, but I, maybe the new members interest group is the best place for that. Then this is Lisa again in terms of the volunteer and the committee uh, involvement. Um, that is a process that incoming section chairs take a, take a big role in and they start around this time. So um, they, they do start to accumulate the forms that have already come in from midwinter but it's a really good time to, to get that in as well because they're just starting their process and that rolls until, Vicki, you can correct me, until about May or June. So um, you know, in terms of informing everybody, they try to have everybody uh, contacted before annual. Yeah, in place because most the terms will generally begin just after annual. So um, fill out the volunteer form, that's the start and uh, make sure that you indicate whether or not you're able to attend a, a conference um, that's because that way we can uh, tailor what we might offer as a volunteer position to you to meet your needs in that case um, so you can, you can participate fully either um, by going to conference or not going to conference either way um, but yeah we would hope to have people in place um, at least a couple of weeks before annual um, and uh, that's the goal Submit the form today. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Thank you, Vicki. Um, I think we're probably wrapping up our time for today. Any last questions or comments? I'd just like to thank um, the, you, Autumn and uh, Dina, for pulling this together. It's been a real pleasure and uh, a real opportunity. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Vicki. A, a big thank you to everyone, the speakers, the facilitators, everyone who helped bring the event together. Um, that includes Dina and Nicole and Betsy on the membership committee, Brooke in the Alex office, and some others. Um, thank you to everyone who attended. We're so pleased that we got a chance to touch base with you today. We really hope to see you at some of the upcoming online and in-person events that we have listed there. Um, please feel free, again, to reach out to any of us any of us if, if um, you have further questions or feedback and do watch your emails too. Um, we'll be sending a survey about this event and we'd appreciate if you took a few minutes to complete that so we can make this event even better next year. Um, remember that a recording of this program will be available soon. I, I hope it's been useful to you. I hope you'll share it with anyone who couldn't be here today. I do hope that um, everyone will fill out that volunteer form uh, if you are members of Alex or, or if you're interested in joining Alex, take a, a look at our, our page, um, and we'd love to see any of you join us. Um, thanks again, everyone.